glad to have you here foraging onto a new avenue of Star Trek. I would love to first introduce my sweet, wonderful husband, Adam. He is mildly intelligent, but his abilities are few. You know, he talks a lot. <laughs> Adam? One of three of those statements is true. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Star Trek Wars, your official bootleg Star Trek podcast. The episode that we are reviewing tonight will be rated on a scale from 1 to 10 by us, the co-hosts, and you guys in the Star Trek Wars Council that left a rating on our Facebook page. I would also like to throw in a very happy, well... Happy welcome birthday to Connor, <laughs> our very own skin sheet supplier and tobacco ambassador. We love you and hope your day is just as special as you have been in our lives and in our podcast lives. Uh, if you would live, if you would wish to join the council and have your vote counted, head over to our Facebook page. You can find us by searching the Star Trek Wars Council should pop up right at the top. There you can rate the episodes yourself and leave a comment that will be potentially read on air. It's a great community. We are all there, very active, and love talking twerk with you. In the meantime, we are reviewing the episode, first episode of season one, so let's get started. Star Trek Prodigy, Season 1, Episode 1, Lost and Found, Parts 1 and 2. In 2383, five years after the USS Voyager returned to Earth, a motley crew of young aliens in the Delta Quadrant find an abandoned Starfleet ship, the USS Protostar. Taking control of the ship, they must learn to work together as they make their way towards the Alpha Quadrant. Created by Kevin and Dan Hagman, a.k.a. the Hagman Brothers. I will head straight on over to you, Adam. What are your initial reactions and observations? Well, I guess I should introduce myself before we start with the observations. Well, I guess that's important. Right. <laughs> um, I've only been on one Star Trek Wars episode, and I was a guest star on the Witcher, uh, the Witcher episode with Connor and some episode. other people. I don't remember the other people no, it on there. Just, it, was just, it was just me. It was literally okay, just it, me. It was just me and Connor talking, no, I feel like. But I was in there, too. That was fun, yeah. and I, uh, I'm wife, really happy to be uh, here. Your wife, who's also up there. Who? Me. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Right. <laughs> That was fun, and, uh, well, it was fun with you, of course. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm happy to be back, and when you asked me to uh, be part of this new segue into a new series, um, it's something that, you know, I, I really felt good about, so thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Um, I studied science in school. Uh, I'm an engineer as a job, but I have a good, I, I like to appreciate artistry in, uh, film and movie or movies and tv shows mm -hmm. and i like video games and so you know I'm, i have a lot of ties to star trek too uh, my dad we used to rent the star trek movies from blockbuster yes physical location movie <laughs> rental now it takes 10 seconds to start a movie which is just crazy but um it's a big deal it was like a ritual we would go to blockbuster my dad would choose one of the six original series movies. <laughs> Is it six or five? Movies? I can't I, Yeah, so, <laughs> and then we would go home, and then I'd get all pumped up about it. And then, you know, as a kid, you watch Star Trek, and you're like, I don't understand any of this. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you had to go to Blockbuster to rent the movie built it up so much. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I have deep roots in Star Trek, and I've always loved watching them with you. Uh, the episodes and the movies, especially revisiting the movies recently. So it's been fun. So yeah, that's uh, who I am. Um, so initial observations, yeah. reactions. I had no idea what to expect. <laughs> you and me are, uh, we're preview averse. We don't like to read blog posts. There are people I know in my work and in my friend groups that they love 
compulsively looking into media articles right. on new series coming out and mm -hmm. like building a perception or a bias against the series. But you and me, we don't like mm -hmm. having our surprise ruined. Right. So I had no idea what to expect. And I was pleasantly surprised. I, it, it, approaching it from uh, a very neutral point of view, um, I was pleasantly surprised. The visuals are really good. The animation style was reminiscent to other rival series, and uh, it had heavy D and D feels. Um, I like that. Some light nods to Voyager. Yes. Of course, when Janeway popped up in the last two minutes, then you're like, "Oh, I guess it is a Star Trek <laughs> TV show." <laughs> Great visual style. Um, a lot of usage of blues and reds, and uh, Contrasting warmths, tragic, complementary colors, uh, very strong, striking visual saturation. So uh, I think that's to appeal to a younger audience. I don't think a younger audience would like a bleak uh, color palette. I think they like really bright, poppy colors, lots of flashy animation, that sort of thing. So that's you, my initial Are reaction. you in with the young crowd, Adam? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Good to know. <laughs> uh, yes, like you. Well, when we watch shows, we don't like spoilers, so I went into it also with a blank mindset. Um, for the most part, it didn't fit my expectations on what I think a Star Trek show should be. But after watching it one and a half to two times, I do think it has potential to be what... I've always kind of wanted a Delta Quadrant Star Trek TV show to be. So I remain hopeful, and I think it has good potential. Yeah, All I right. agree. I agree with you. There's <laughs> well, a lot of potential. Yeah. Let's go on to our pros. Adam, please start us off with your main pros. Well, the pilot never sat still. It was kind of always on the move. Yeah. Um, I would attribute part of that to uh, the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, th I thought it was a strong start. Um, so yeah, the, the variety character development, uh, it, was, it, it, it ended very open-endedly. Um, they were kind of free to explore when they uh, finally had escaped. And um, I thought, again, the color choices, design and animation, big budget. Yes. Definitely a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, huge art teams working really hard on making sure it looked visually very striking. Absolutely. Um, it will appear to a younger audience that hasn't likely hasn't watched too many of the older Star Trek series. Mm -hmm. So I get the feeling that Paramount Plus is trying to pull over Disney Plus viewers, younger Disney Plus viewers. Interesting. Uh, and uh, it has better ratings than Lower Decks did. And Lower Decks is, really? I think, a more established series now. I haven't watched Lower Decks, but I went from what I've that read. That is not is the vibe that I get from series. the Facebook council. <laughs> well, they probably know better than uh, Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my pros. All right. Uh, for me, uh, this show excites me for a couple of reasons. First off, I loved Voyager because they were so cut off from everything that they knew. But they worked so hard together to make a home and carve a path for Starfleet in a quadrant that has no knowledge of the Federation whatsoever. Secondly, I love any Star Trek show that isn't about the perfect Starfleet robot ideals. I love Starfleet ideals. I think they're wonderful. But I also love a good rebel. I want to see people be excited about their own ideas of things i don't know right shake it up a bit i'm all here for it lower decks is doing a really good job doing things with that but i feel like this show has the markings for a good plot point but we'll have to see as we move forward i loved the proto star the ship oh it's so beautiful um it reminds me of an observatory or a greenhouse with this beautiful open windows on the bridge um but i think we can all agree the best part of the episode is when that humongous shiny ship appeared on our screens and a rock talk poked that com badge 
It was beautiful, stunning ship activation, and I will never get over that. It was beautiful. So I, I have a theory on why the ship was there. Oh. Right. Let's not escape pros just yet, because when I just when I ran through my my pros bullet points, okay, I realized I should probably draw them out a little more since I have a lot of notes. <laughs> You've got literally a whole book on your side of the table. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with why the protostar was there. Uh, resting gently mm-hmm. on a bed of chimerium, right? So maybe uh, it was placed there. So what, what I found was that chimerium in the, well, uh, the non-canon wiki, which okay. is um, uh, the only site that I found anything on chimerium for, the non-canon wiki stated that... Um, Chimerium is a, a mineral, a rare mineral with natural sensor blocking and phaser reflecting properties. Oh. So do you think that the ship was set there as some sort of like sensor vault to keep anyone from finding it? That is one theory. Right. I do not hold, but that is one theory. So that's my theory is that it was hidden there. But of course, <laughs> you're going to hide a ship. Why would you leave the keys and the ignition and the doors unlocked that two lunky miners who happen upon <laughs> it can just simply open the door and start start it up? <laughs> I'd love to see about that. So, um, no, so yeah, that's a good that, point to make. I like so that's that. my vault theory. I'm oh. calling it the vault theory, right? The vault but, theory. Yeah, I have. Um, my, yeah, so the the, the vault theory is uh, basically that the ship's placed there and it's hidden in the chimerium, which is this rare mineral that everyone's mining, right? But um, how does this diviner play into it? I know. guess we'll have to see. Does he, know, does he think that the ship is there because um, he pursued whoever was flying the ship prior? At the end, very end of the episode, he says... Oh, wait, hold on. I gotta look. I Get me my ship. <laughs> right? My ship. So, the my stood out to me. Like, did, was he an old Starfleet captain? And now he wants that ship back? Are you part of your pros? Yeah. I feel like this is a pro for you. Uh, yeah. All right. We'll put that in your press. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, for me, Murph. Murph is so cute. I love him so much. Um, maybe I'm biased, but he is basically the embodiment of our son at this time <laughs> in life. He talks mostly in babbles and eats everything yes. that he isn't supposed to. He also looks like a peep made out of jello. So lots of similarities there. I would argue toothpaste. <laughs> I call him a space toothpaste slug. Oh, no, I think a little peep jello, buddy. <laughs> so cute. Um, and I know that it's, this is a key part of the show, but I love Janeway being tied into the Delta Quadrant. And I 100% love how hologram Janeway has the original Janeway hairstyle. And I know that she would be the ideal Starfleet ambassador to the Delta Quadrant, in my humble opinion. Uh, the dark vibe and bright colors which you will probably describe better than me remind me of discovery in some way um but animated and a little bit dumbed down also i liked the child like little kitty cat i feel like she has a bigger role in this show, thank you, Cadian. Uh, she's too cute not to. In that last glimpse of her, you know she's gonna be um, somehow involved in our futures. They um, they are described as intelligent, loyal, and curious. Interesting. But yeah, I liked a lot of the characters. I like Rock Talk. I like Progeny. Her tattoo is it Pro- Gwen? Gwen. Her name's Gwen. Gwen. Gwen the progeny. She's the progeny of Solom. I loved her tattoo. Um, what's it called? Weapon, I guess. Her hair, her glowing veins, everything about her is very cool. I love her as a 
strong female character in the yes. series. It's very cool. Yeah, I'm also a uh, bull for Gwen. Gwen. Gwen is the boy version. <laughs> Gwen has the Y in it. <laughs> All right, so Adam, I've, let's move on to your neutral zones for this episode. Things that you weren't quite sure about. Right. Well, um, for one, that the crevasse in which they discover the protostar is called the Northwest Crevasse. Mm -hmm. So, I'm guessing they use traditional earthen uh, units for determining directions. Oh, well, that's a good point. Topologically. <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the Northwest Crevasse. So, they use Northwest Southeast. Okay. Uh, but maybe that's a writing anomaly. Um... Rock Talk looks a lot like Fantastic Four is the thing. <laughs> oh. Uh, but to avoid overlaps with the thing's character, I'm pretty sure they wrote in like an 11-year-old just to like throw everyone off. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call it a con because it still works really well. So right. I'm neutral, neutral on that. Awesome. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Let's go to you and I'll think more about more neutral topics. Okay. We could pick up later. Yeah. Um, so, for me, this is a general hypothesis kind of thing. Uh, I think that will happen, so I'm hyped up about, but obviously I have no real expectations for what will happen in the future. Um, I feel like Fugitive Zero is going to get upgraded, and it's, I would love if they took parts from the Protostar to embody Fugitive Zero into this amazing bot. Right. Them, they kind of. When Fugitive Zero first pops everything. up, everything. You're looking at the suit and you're like, who designed that? And then she goes, try <laughs> designing a suit myself. without no hands. And then you're like, <laughs> I don't Wait. think she said no hands. She's not country. <laughs> I'm away from country. Try designing a suit without any hands. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> With a soft English accent, of course. Yeah, but every accent and you do she soft said it like country. She said it like a flex, and everyone around her was like, okay, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> but very, I think, uh, she looks like Mike Wazowski. <laughs> so let's just take a moment to picture the entire series progressing, but in Billy Crystal's voice. Oh, okay. As Fugitive let's Zero. Not, let's not picture that which, at all. Which in my notes, uh, Fugitive think... Zero is, Fugo, Fugo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's not picture that. Um, this might be a hot take, but I do not think that the Proto Star was there by accident or error. In my mind, Starfleet has placed the ship there, and Janeway Helper hologram that, and they placed the Janeway Helper hologram so they can continue their progress in the Delta Quadrant with no extra fatalities. And I hold out hope for the character growth. In our new crew, which we all do the same at this point. Uh, I'm really curious about the Diviner needing this Dalek-type cage to keep him young. He's got a lot more to say, and I'm very much here for it. Um, I love all of that, but it's still a neutral zone because we don't know anything about him. Uh, coming up after the break... We will delve into our cons, your comments, and our ratings. Hi folks, Jeremy here, Federation President of the Galactic Star Trek Wars Empire. I just sat down to record the second episode of the Star Trek Wars Patreon show. If you listened to the free episode last week, you know that Chelsea and I are currently covering the top 10 episodes of all the original Classic 5 series. So after you've finished listening to today's coverage of Brand New Trek, come join us over at patreon.com slash Star Trek Wars to listen to our bi-weekly coverage reminiscing about the old Trek. That's TOS through Enterprise. We live in exciting Trek times, my friends. We'll see you there. I now return you back to your live, regular programming. Adam, I know that you do have a couple of extra pros that you Oops. wanted to add in. Yes, I got ahead of myself. Sorry. <laughs> What's new? <laughs> so, 
uh, I want to talk about Murph a little bit, mm, right? Cutie. You brought him up, the peep toothpaste character. Nope, Jello. Has about four lines in the whole episode. Uh, so I call him I call him a toothpaste scrub, but you know, he eats whatever he can get his mouth on. Um, so, uh, he's, yeah, little trills and, and chirps and stuff. But uh, evidently a lot of work went into determining what kind of noises this creature made. Okay. <laughs> he's uh, voiced by D. Bradley Baker. Um, I and did if you don't... Notice, notice that he has a voice actor, and I'm thinking... Yeah. Okay, Except where's he's that not, guy? He's Coming not up. some intern who made a weird sound next to the copier and the producer noticed him. All right. <laughs> this guy... This guy has been in the industry as long as I've been alive, really? which is a nice, fresh 22 years. <clears throat> 32. Wait. 20. Okay. So, uh, yeah, 89. Um, and he has, he's a veteran voice actor. Like, his really? first job was uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple, which is like a Nickelodeon show. Okay. And he voiced the temple god and the announcer. So uh, you probably don't recognize it because you didn't have cable TV I growing up. Alive then. Neither did I. Wait, okay, this was later on. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy's been around a long time. But the really interesting aspect to D. Bradley Baker that I found was that he is most notable for his Star Wars voice acting jobs. In Clone Wars, Bad Batch, and Rebels, all animation series. All right, we got so, another tie in there. Why would why would uh, Nickelodeon snipe a veteran Disney animation voice actor to play a little voiceless character? That's pretty interesting to me. That Anyways, it's a good question. So yeah. Murph, he's a little blobby dude, and he just kind of runs around and eats anything he wants. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, his origins. Did his parents grow up there, and he just kind of like bought, was on the mining thing, and he just continues to eat tools that people drop? Or what did he eat to get thrown in jail? Is <laughs> my real question. Yeah, if he obviously isn't being picked up by the translators then he didn't know how to speak anything beforehand so he might have been on the planet from the beginning that's a good point right or rock the 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 point rock makes is he's too advanced for any translator which is kind of funny so they're so sweet what i'm trying to say is uh, a lot of potential for murph the writing could go many different directions with his arc and it could be he could do stupid little simple things and they always save the day. Or he could eventually become like a really established character that has real impact on the team. Or an evil villain. All Ouch. right. Yeah. Uh, we are jumping straight back into our cons. Right. Adam, please, will you start us off with only your cons? Only my cons. Okay. <laughs> so can I go to neutrals real fast? I'm just kidding. I know you were cut off. <laughs> <laughs> I did say you talked a lot. Okay, so um, in my cons, uh, Gwen, an obvious polyglot, multiple lingu- can Ooh. speak multiple languages. That's has, a big. Has word. issues uh, pronouncing cahoots and it says cat boots. <laughs> Is this some reference to the caddy and she just? Adopted? No, I think Mm. that's just an oversight. It's a forced joke. (laughs) Um, Point. Yeah, she has a a, an argument with her father, the designer in Van Nakat. I'm considering this a con because, uh, well, it was embarrassing for me. So I googled Van Nakat Star Trek, and Google autocorrected me to Van Naked Star Trek. I felt really awkward about that. So that's a a con. (laughs) PG. Um. Yeah. Let me think. What else? Oh, Jenkin Pon Pog. Jenkin Pog. Pog. Jenkin Pog. Which? Um. Not very noteworthy. Uh. Not a single. SOP, which is industry lingo for standard operating procedure in sight. He just kind of cuts and welds and does whatever he wants He's to. He's not noteworthy with his 
How does he know how to work Technical on like a high level Federation Star Trip starship? I mean, I guess there's one line where he goes, "See one, seen them all," and then Zira goes, "But there's millions of ships." So <laughs> I think he's pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah, Jason Mansukas was. Um, I recognized, well, I mean, I didn't recognize him in the show, but, you know, uh, he was in Parks and Rec. Brooklyn Nine-Nine. <laughs> As uh, the douchebag uh, cologne company owner, Dennis Feinstein, which he's very iconic in that role. I didn't like him that much in that role because he was an ass. I supposed to not like him. <laughs> One more con. <laughs> Operating a mining vehicle without speaking any of the languages and also not being able to read any of the labels on anything. So, um, you know, not, not, that, right. not that, not a whole Star Trek ship. Right, exactly. Well, a, a vehicle operation, I think, in general, was uh, very guesstimated. They just kind of guessed their way through the GUIs and somehow ended up with all the right buttons. I think that's kind of a Star Trek thing. Is it? That's good to know. That's good to know. (laughs) Everyone always ends up in an alien starship and knows what they're doing. Uh. The formula was familiar. I didn't... Star Trek always has this added layer to it in the writing where you always feel like there's something you can think about when the episode ends. And I think that's a very strong point. Of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. But with this series, at least with the cut off pilot episode, it didn't really feel like that. There wasn't really anything for me to rest on and think about a more higher level concept. Yep. And Star Trek's always done that very well. That's a good point. All right. Uh, for me, the show definitely was poised for teens, not kids like advertised. Uh, the scenes move so fast, I have to keep reminding myself this isn't meant for adults. It's bright, colorful, and overstimulating everything a growing child needs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole thing is giving Clone Wars slash Trolls energy. I've never seen Clone Wars or Trolls, but I have babysit quite a many times in my fu- in my past. Uh, so, I kind of <laughs> know the essence. You've watched them peripherally. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to relate with the style with a canon Star Trek TV show. I agree. I felt like a bunch of video game cutscenes were happening in the first half. And again, I love that style, but it also felt very wrong for what I'm so in love with Star Trek for. Um, I didn't understand also when they go into the deep mines why are Rock Talk and Doll the only ones connected by electric rope? In the training video on the elevator, they clearly show everyone chained up, but they are obviously the only ones that appear to be connected at all in the whole scene. I I don't understand. Uh, Also, super personal, hate the name Gwen, but I also hate that they call her the progeny, but the show is called Prodigy. That's unnecessarily confusing. Please, if anyone has any insight, correct me. They had me thinking I was pronouncing the whole show wrong for a bit. I was Googling it. Is it progeny, not prodigy? Um, lastly, I was wondering why it was so easy to get into the ship until I realized the shields were down, but it seems way too easy and a bit trap-ish. That sounds like a music genre. Um, <laughs> that being said... It is a music genre. Lita. <laughs> trap-ish. Yeah. Well, just trap, but yes. Okay, but that that's a definite con for me. <laughs> that being said... Let's please move on to uh, Adam. I know Mm. that you do have a few insights to the art of this show. Being an artist yourself, please fill us all in on your insights. On the artistry itself, right? Uh, Should I do my thing now? Yeah. Okay. Dive in. Sure. Well, I, I thought it would be interesting to 
bring up towards the end of the show before we do the ratings and stuff. Um, some technical insights, either scientific or other, uh, that are interesting. Uh, and so I decided, since I have a sporadic personality that really <laughs> never uh, stops and my mind is always kind of moving from one thing to the other, to call them tech tribbles because these tribbles can multiply without hmm. any warning. It sounds kind of like Jordan's fun facts. Yeah. They Except just these go on forever. These will bore you to death. <laughs> and Jordan's fun facts are probably funny. <laughs> no. These should be interesting. I'll keep it short. So, uh, my first tech triple is uh, uh, this show is obviously completely CGI, right? And mm -hmm. uh, computer graphics have come a long way in the past few years. And so, in order to create a computer graphics simulation, you have to generate a lot of static images and then play them one after the other, and then it looks like an animation. That's what animation is. So the images in this show are very beautiful, and you have a lot. I mean, well, some people have remarked that it's very dismal and dark, but you know there are certain scenes where you have these big drawing uh, skyscapes and nice parallax uh, scanning, and so yeah. you know really, I, I thought it was above and beyond. Um, so. Uh, CGI is computationally very heavy and it takes a lot of uh, power in order to generate all these images one after the other to create these animations. And so what, from what I've seen and what I've read, uh, it took about two years to create prog progeny. Star Trek progeny. Prodigy. Oh, prodigy. <laughs> oh, my God. Now we're all confused. <laughs> so the very first CGI actually in Star Trek was used in Star Trek 2 which was Wrath of Khan. Uh, and Lucasfilm Graphics Group, then a subsidiary of Industrial Light and Magic Island, was responsible for Project Genesis, the demonstration sequence event. Okay. Yeah. We, she just watched. Do yeah. you remember it? No, we just watched. I don't remember it. Ago. I'm just kidding. I remember it. <laughs> so the very first fully textured 3D CGI representation shown in a motion picture business to a general public was in Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. Wow. The fun, the interesting part about it is that that graphics group later evolved into Pixar in 1986. No way. Yeah. <gasps> they gave us a Toy Story. Yeah. So most Star Trek productions use traditional methods of creating VFX, visual effects. Um, and it was not until the advent of Star Trek Enterprise that these methods were abandoned altogether just in form and in, in uh, favor of, of CGI. Huh. Yeah. Enterprise. Uh -huh. Oh. Bummer. It's okay. We, <laughs> we love. We love it. We love Enterprise. <laughs> so to create all of these images, you have to have a lot of parallel graphics processing units running side by side to gener to tell all the individual pixels what to do. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, it's very complicated and it takes a lot of processing power. So, Pixar has a huge render farm, which is basically a supercomputer composed of 2,000 individual computers and 24,000 cores. Each core is a logical unit that can process, that can send instructions and process what these pixels are doing at each point in time. So if you picture like um, a monitor screen being comprised of one pixel, you wouldn't see anything. It has to be thousands of pixels big for you to actually like see what's going on. Yeah. Right. So you have to hand instructions to every single pixel in order for animation or an image to appear. So it's a very in process intense um, thing that has to happen. So Pixar has this huge render farm with 24,000 cores, and this data is a little bit old given the titles that were mentioned in the PDF, <laughs> but it makes still made one of the tw one of the largest supercomputers in the world, Pixar. Dang. The people make the movies. And it took two years to render a movie like Monsters University. Mike Wazowski reference. I'm stuck on Mike Wazowski. I think yeah. Zero looks like Mike Wazowski. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. It'll stick until, until zero. They're both adorable. Finds a new housing with uh, <laughs> ship parts like you mentioned. So Monsters University took... Right, okay, right. Well, I think it'll happen. 
They can't keep her, like, the, the suit didn't even have matching knees. I'm surprised the legs were the same length. It's them, <laughs> they, their I'm inner body. I'm surprised the legs is, were the same length. And their inner you know body is the only okay. thing that matters. Let's talk about Zero because, you know what? She had no hands, Just go and on. she manipulated <laughs> some poor engineer into making that I suit, feel like and they made it the shape of an eyeball. All right, I'll keep going. This is the second So episode. it took two years to render a movie like Monsters University, which took 100 million CPU hours to render, which is equivalent of 10,000 years for a single computer to render that movie, a two-hour-long movie, because of all the frames and intense frames. That's a good And intense. Com- computing power required to make those frames. Okay, I'm done. Oh, wait, I have one more thing. 90% of all the monsters in Monsters, Inc. have Mike Wazowski's tongue. Tongue? <laughs> Ew, what? I really wish you hadn't added that. That made me very uncomfortable. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Let's dive into our fan comments. We want to hear what you had to say. Uh, I'm going to start off with our council member, James King, who says, I've obviously never seen it. Since we won't be getting it in the UK until next year, I am so sorry. Uh, However, if I had seen it, I would have been a little hotter on it than you guys. I enjoyed the first half mainly because it reminded me of the 80s classic and in no way Starter Wars ripoff. Star Chaser, The Legend of Orion. Cool. You know that? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to look it up, though. Sounds very cool. <laughs> um, I thought the characters seemed interesting, but the main guy was a bit too cool for school. I agree. Probably appealing to the demographic, which was not to my liking, but not a deal breaker. As you said... It really picks up and seems to be setting us up for a fun ride. There is a lot of Trek canon questions. Mm -hmm. How did the Alpha Quadrant species get there, etc. But I am sure they'll be dealt with. It looked gorgeous, and the feeling of hope and wonder that Starfleet inspired was present and correct. I'm excited. Well said, James. Well, there's... You jumped the gun. Oops. Maybe maybe it was because whenever I do watch in the future, I'll have a long couple of days and be pretty tired, so it'll be just what I need at the time. What's that, James? (laughs) Barbara Whipple says, I... Can I comment on James' comment? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I agree. (laughs) I think he's... (laughs) That's it. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Whipple says, I didn't like it. The art was pretty, but the story was very dark. Mm -hmm. Prison Planet does not strike me as a good place for a kid's show. It was confusing, too, and I had no idea they were looking for a hidden ship. A lot of characters looked like they stepped out of Star Wars, which was disappointing. I agree, Barbara. But I liked the monster with the surprise voice. I never liked kids' cartoons where the main point is fighting an evil bad guy. I steer kids away from that kind of show, so that's what this looks like. When they get away and have Janeway in the story, it might improve, so I'll try again next week, I think. If they would leave out the more adult jokes, that lower decks would be a better fit for kids. Hmm. Controversial, but you make great points. I mean, it it is a kind of dark um one of my cons was the the fact that it is uh, actually as a con i didn't mention there's many of them but it's no, okay i feel like it, um, it they told us it was going to be for kids and i feel like it's for teens i feel like they made it for they were intended it for kids yeah and then it ended up being for teens <laughs> <laughs> oops so and that probably has something to do with the uh art director um, if you look him up, hold on, I have his name right here. Reach for the stars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Alessandro Taihi, I think is how you say his name. Oh. An Italian guy. Uh, 
he was a um, and the art director at Ninja Theory, and they make some d- pretty dark video games. So probably uh, some correlation there. But uh, I I agree with you. I, uh, I think it is more a, a early teen less kids. I never got the kids vibe from. Mm-hmm. No, I would not let my son watch run, jump, that. shoot, yell. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's <laughs> <laughs> just the style of it. Okay. Uh, Tony DeSimone says, kind of felt more like Star Wars than Star Trek, but it was still a lot of fun. Had a great setup, animation, and music is excellent as well. Yes. Thank you to everyone who commented. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will move on to our ratings. Adam, what do you rate? This episode, one out of ten. Drum roll, please. Brrr. My rating is seven proto stars <gasps> out of ten. That was pretty good. I like that. <laughs> uh, I gave this episode seven star freckles what? because Doll has star freckles and they're really cute. I think he's adorable, even with the little rat tail so coming cute. out of his cranium. I think he's adorable. I don't know. I like it. Anyways. <laughs> uh, Adam, do you have a next time on or a deleted scene that you would like to share with us? Do we want to share the Star Trek Council ratings? I guess we can do that first. Sure, whatever. <laughs> so the Star Trek Council and a lump sum rated an average of seven. Wow, even seven. Even se- seven, seven, seven. Seven, Lucky. nine? No, just even seven. Oh, okay. I, hold on, let me do the math. <laughs> no, seven or eight, sorry. Oh. Uh, Bummer. That's One disappointing. Short. That would have been prophetic. Oh, well. Maybe next time <laughs> someone extra will vote. <laughs> All right. And with us... I guess we both rated it seven, so it evens out to an even seven after the council. I mean, if my oh. math is correct, the average of seven <laughs> plus seven <laughs> plus seven, I think is seven. I think that means that we are all on the same page when we, we are like all it, on the same page, guys. But we want to know more. We want to know more. Mm-hmm. See, mine was my rating was speculative. Maybe not on what I saw, but what I think could happen. Well, I think you know best. What's well, your next you. time or deleted scene? Oh, no. Or... Next time. I don't have a deleted scene. I have That's a next fine. time. Whichever. Do you want to do your next time first? Mine's kind of long. Okay, sure. Uh, okay. Next time, the new crew of the Protostar unites around Janeway helper program to form a cult with her and their leader <laughs> forming a ring of terror in the Delta Quadrant. Tune in next time. <laughs> a death cult led by a malignant AI. We will help you to death. Roko's Basilisk. <laughs> okay. My next time is The ship has veered further into the Delta Quadrant, but the crew cannot figure out how to use warp as Janeway's instructions involve layers of intense calculations only Star Trek (laughs) Starfleet graduates learn through years of training. That and the computer is not turning on. (laughs) That also helps. Dreadnought is hot on their trail with an assimilated fleet of killer mind policing robots. The Diviner begins to take a raisin-like form, spending most of his time yelling at Dreadnought over the radio in his room. As the minor crew bumbles around the protostar, Murph has seemingly disappeared. Rock becomes obsessed with locating the little star slug, but not knowing how to operate the ship's GUIs, she accidentally opens an airlock Fugitive Zero was napping inside of. Zero launches out in front of the ship at incredible speeds. Eventually, in a perfectly parabolic arch, hurls back towards it to punch a baseball-like hole in the flight deck's many spacious (laughs) windows. No! (laughs) 
The deck becomes depressurized, and the adventure is seemingly over. However, to the tawny crew's surprise, Murph is sucked out of a loose panel on the floor where he'd been munching on the warp computer's hardware. The depressurization pulls him into the baseball-shaped hole. His toothpaste-like body seals it perfectly, and again, Murph saves everyone's asses. <laughs> That's I it. love that. That's perfect. <laughs> um, that sh- that should have been the ending to the show. I'd watch that episode. I I <laughs> feel like I will watch that episode. <laughs> right. All right. So how did Prodigy do this week? Oh, we already went over that using the combined average score of ourselves and you guys who got voted at home. I was going to get seven, to that. I was seven. I was going to get to that. It's a lucky oh, week. Don't listen to him. Adam has concluded that it all got an even average seven. Yes. We all agree. Using we advanced like it. mathematics. Star Trek is wonderful, and but we want to know more. Uh, that will do it for this week. Star Trek Wars is available on Apple Podcasts iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and anywhere else fine park podcasts are heard. Podcasts. Par- okay, don't pick on me. <laughs> <laughs> you can also find us on Twitter at Star Trek The Star Trek Wars. If you would like any Star Trek Wars merchandise, please head over to redbubble.com. Or follow the link attached to this episode. I do have to add that my talented husband designed a few of those designs. So please, if anything, go look at the cool merch that we have to offer. It's like a free art show. There's a lot of options. I'm a regular just browser. I like to put things in my basket and leave them alone. (laughs) Go look at things, see if you like stuff, whatever. Um, But that makes us happy. Adam, it is always a pleasure for doing this with me. Thank you for being here. Uh, The two of us will be back next week for the second episode of Prodigy. And until then, we will see you next time on Star Trek Wars. Wars. Progeny. Prodigy. Bye. Progeny. Prodigy. Prodigy. I said that. <sighs> we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Star Trek Wars.